It's an interesting one. It's sort of our two two gigahertz processors at the same speed. To understand this one, you need to understand what the megahertz or the gigahertz or the kilohertz, if we go back off our often terahertz processors. They'd be fast. Will we ever get a terahertz processor? Don't know. Anyway, I digress. We need to think about what that's actually describing. We tend to think that we can describe the speed of a processor by looking at its gigahertz rating. So a 1.6 gigahertz processor is faster than a 1.5, a 2 gigahertz processor is faster than a 1.6, and so on. To an extent that's true, but it only really fits if you've got the same model of processors. But if you compare different, even different iterations of Intel's Core i7 architecture, or say a Core i7 compared to a Ryzen chip, then an AMD Ryzen chip, then it breaks down and it's down to what the megahertz is describing and then how the CPU is built inside. So the, the megahertz or the gigahertz is describing how fast the clock which synchronizes the computer runs. A way to think about this is if you think about the conductor of an orchestra, he's keeping time, the orchestra is then playing in time. That's what the clock in a CPU does. It keeps track of time of what's happening. And if you think back to the previous video we did about a couple of years ago on pipelines, in a modern CPU, you have a series of steps that goes through. At the very simple, we could label this as we've got a fetch step, a decode step, and an execute step. And this is similar to what the original ARM CPU had. And so in the first clock cycle, I'm gonna use two colors here. We start fetching the first instruction. Then in the second clock cycle, we start decoding that instruction and fetching the second instruction. Then in the third clock cycle, we actually get around to executing this one. We decode the second and we start fetching the third and so on. And this goes on. So we then get the fourth, we're decoding the third and we execute the second and so on. This continues providing that we can actually satisfy things and we don't get any pipeline stalls. This happens as long as we don't require part of the CPU that's here, say, to be here. So for example, a CPU can only access one thing from memory at a time, then we can't fetch and fetch from memory at the same time in these stages. We get a stall. Watch the other video for that. This may look like we're doing more than one thing at a time. The answer is yes, we are. We're trying to speed up the execution of our CPU and realizing that actually when we're executing things, we're not using this bit normally. So if we break things up into a pipeline, then we can have all bits of the CPU happening. We can think about these being synchronized to the clock. We do this bit here in the first clock cycle. This is the second clock cycle, the third clock cycle, the fourth clock cycle. And so if we keep this structure, we make our clock cycles shorter, i.e. we run at higher megahertz speed, high gigahertz speed, then things get faster. So this works fine. And if we increase the clock speed, then we can decrease the amount of time that each of these steps take. But there becomes a limit because these are implemented in digital logic. Then after a while, the logic itself will take up a certain amount of time and we won't be able to reduce it anymore because otherwise the clock speed would be ticking over before we'd finish running the logic. It's what's called the propagation delay in the digital logic. So we've got a minimum amount of time and actually it'll probably be governed by one of these steps. So there's going to be a limit on how fast we can get our clock speed based on the logic. But we can get around that by actually making our pipeline longer. So what we could say is, let's say we break it down not into three steps, but into six smaller steps. And they would do parts of what was being done in here and so on. So this one might fetch, this might part decode, this might finish decoding, this might get something from a register, and, and these two might do part of the execution and so on. I'm making up different things here. There's various ways you can build these things. And in this case, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six steps. So it'll take longer for our pipeline to get full, but when it does, if we can run at full pelt, we'll be able to run faster with a faster clock speed because each of these steps take up less time. Of course, the problem is, is that if we then get a bubble in our pipeline, then it'll take longer to refill. So here we've got a bubble, we perhaps had a one or two cycle delay. Here we'd have a four or five cycle delay at possible. So if this was say running at one gigahertz and this was at 1.2, a five cycle delay would take longer than one cycle delay here and so on. And so what you can see is that our CPU design, the architecture, the way the internal bits are built, has as much influence on how fast the program runs as the clock speed. And increasing the clock speed 
but changing the design doesn't necessarily mean that it'll be faster even though it's running faster. Now hopefully you can get it and sometimes you have to redesign your program to get that best advantage out of it. So the changes in the architecture have an effect. So what you need to do is design your CPU so that you try and avoid getting those bubbles in the pipeline that actually even though you've got a faster CPU because we're now executing these instructions on a much quicker basis we want to keep the pipeline full and so what you end up doing is designing other bits of things things like superscalar architecture which we talked about before where we can run more than one instruction at the same time you have out of order execution where you move things around to try and avoid the bubbles and you to do that you rename registers and have more registers and things all sorts of things going on you have a branch predictor which is trying to make sure that we don't get the bubbles in the first place by choosing the right instructions and so on and all of that can have an influence on how fast your CPU actually runs the code as much as this clock speed. So the clock speed does tell you how fast it is, but you can't really use it to compare between different CPUs of different types. So we can execute that multiply D up there. We think, well, okay, can we do the add at the same time? Well, no, because we need the result of that as well. So we can then execute the add down here before finally, and it just fits on the paper. That. So we can actually squash things up and we're going to save some time.